Okay, then we'll start with the stuff from today, uh, which has to do with micro benchmarking. I only added a little bit to this presentation because the chapter is so short, there's really not anything else that can be added to it uh, without overcomplicating it. So uh, the bench package is what we're gonna be using to benchmark some pieces of code. <clears throat> So you have a uniform distribution of 100. And if we benchmark square root x versus x to the 0.5, there's a difference in the computation time. Anybody want to take a guess at why that is? Um, I think we discussed this last week, didn't we? Which is um, yeah. when, it, when it's actually a function, it's often been optimized for speed. Those, yeah. Yeah. Could it also the, be that, for instance, they're using like C sharp, sorry, C plus in background? Um, yeah. To... That's it. Yeah. So, well, they both use the same internal, um, but square root just calls the internal function directly, whereas to the point five looks at the left hand and right hand side and does some checks on the right hand side like on making sure it's like a numeric or whatnot. Um, so that adds some computation time. And that's just the plot of it. So making it go fast, five different steps to do so. Organize your code, look for existing solutions, the importance of being lazy, vectorizing, and avoid the perils of copying data. We kind of already know about that one from chapter two. Uh, either use pre-allocation or use vectorized functions that will create data structures as they go rather than copying it. So this is mean and a trimmed down version of mean that does the sum divided by length. And if we do those, we can see there's a difference here. And the difference is, again, uh, because of internal checks with mean. Mean does some checks on like the kind of data that goes into the mean function, whereas sum x, length x does not do those same checks. So it ends up being faster. So. Looking for existing solutions, there are CRAN task views. This is a service I have not used before. Has anybody used it before? No, me neither. It's kind of interesting. I guess it's like based on a task that is common. They list the different packages that are available to do it. Sounds pretty useful. I'm going to try it at some point. Um, you can go look at the RCPP package and look at the reverse dependencies because there are gonna be packages created with those C-level functions in those reverse dependencies. So they're gonna be faster. You might be able to find a solution there. And then rseq.org, anybody use that? No, me neither. Uh, but it's, it's basically just like searches are related stuff using a Google type search. So it probably works pretty well. Um, Stack Overflow, you can use that R tag when you search to just confine your search to the R language. Uh, I have used that before. And then there's the RStudio community and obviously R for DS. Um, and I'd say that's a pretty good order to go in in terms of looking for solutions is to consult the first three first and then r for ds and then also that's not on there is like github just searching github for it as well all right so do as little as possible use a function tailored to a more specific type of input or to a more specific problems so row sums, call sums, row means and call means are all vectorized. So they are faster than apply. And I didn't test it, but I bet they're faster than map too because they're, they're vectorized. Um, and they use just like direct 
computation on met, uh, matrices and vectors. So V apply is faster than S apply because you can specify the output type. Uh, any is faster than 10 in X because testing equality is simpler than testing set inclusion. So avoid situations. Well, the thing about this is uh, you can't do like X equals equals and then use a vector. It, it won't work. So if you're going to use more than one thing that you're testing for, you have to use n uh, for the set inclusion feature. Avoid situations where input data has to be coerced into a different type. So giving a data frame to a function that requires a matrix like apply, that coercion is also often very expensive. And you typically don't want to do that, uh, especially if you have a lot of data. Other tips, read R, read CSV, or using data table F read. I'm, I'm sure August has probably encountered that or somebody has mentioned it. Uh, data table F read. Um, bones doesn't have any of the kind of like smart detection of column types. It uses like base level column types. Um, so you might have to do a mutate or whatnot after using fread to get your call types to something other than the basic like numeric character or um, I'm blanking on the other data type, but uh, yeah. So, oops, factor, specify known levels. If you just tell it what levels you're expecting, then it doesn't try to guess them. Cut and find interval. I had never heard of find interval before, but that's a useful function. It allows you to create like grouping labels with open or closed uh, specific cut points, breakpoints. Um, and it has some modifications for like telling which end is open or closed. Pretty useful. I've never really used that because continuous is generally more information rich than bins, but every once in a while you have to use bins. Unlist, usenames faults will drop the names and often like that's what you want anyway because unlist is gonna drop them or they're just not as useful when you unlist it. Uh, interaction, use drop true if you can. I have never used interaction. Was it, have you all used interaction? Some? Like one time, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same. I've only used it a couple of times. I think I actually only used it like in ggplot to do a group that was an interaction, not even like in modeling. Hmm. Okay. All right, so example, avoiding method dispatch is one way to speed things up if you are low level programming. So we can see here that calling the defaults mean, like if we know that we're inputting a numeric and we don't need the checks, then we can use mean default and it's about takes about a quarter of the time, about 75%, well, a little less than that, 70% um, more effective or faster. And then as you gradually get more data, those improvements really don't matter so much because most of the time is spent actually doing the computations rather than the uh, the checking the values that are input. So it's diminishing returns if you've got a lot of data. Uh, internal is how you can call the base R internal functions. 
And because those are low levels, there's no checks whatsoever. And if you are not absolutely certain of what you're putting in there, you will encounter a, a hard stop, like a, the program will hang or it will abort um, if you give a C function something that it doesn't expect. So use those only if you know for certain what the inputs are going to be and what the outputs you expect are. OK. Uh, as data frame is slow because it coerces every single element into a data frame, uh, you could instead store your data frame in a named list of equal length vectors. So this quick DF does exactly that assigns a class and then I guess this internal set row names does a you know one through whatever value you give it to create row names and outputs so if we create a large matrix here or a large list and give it the letters of the alphabet as names we can glimpse that and uh, it works basically the same way as a data frame because the data frame is just list columns, is using list columns. So it'll be coercible in, in mostly the same way, slightly faster. As we can see here, sixty four point eight microseconds versus 8.38 milliseconds for as data frame, so significantly faster. And there was a little bit in the chapter, if y'all read it, about how Hadley basically just went through a function, the as data frame function, and just trimmed away code bit by bit and tested it each time he did to make sure it still gave the output values that he expected, just to get down to like bare bones, what was exact tiniest amount of code that would do what was intended without all the other stuff so that's something that's an approach that can be done is just like using an existing function and for your specific use case there are probably you know sanity checks that package designers put in there that are unnecessary because of your internal use of that particular function so you can strip it down and omit those to gain efficiency. Vectorization, find the existing R function that is implemented in C and most closely applies to your problem or check the RCPP reverse depends for more complex functions. Uh, these are commonly used ones, cut, find interval, da da da. Cumulative sum and diff are two that I'm sure folks have encountered before just a cumulative sum and then doing a diff between the different values in a vector to get the, the, the intervals between each value uh, are useful in a lot of situations. Or you can use matrix, matrix algebra if you are familiar with how that works. Um, that will speed things up. And there's an article here that he added about vectorization in R and why it is worth doing. So yeah, could be worth looking at. Okay, so, and avoid copying. These are the typical culprits, but obviously any dplyr functions like bind rows and whatnot um, will also be copying data over and slow things down. So they're generally not the recommended way to do it. So we can see here that demonstrated if we have a function that generates or samples 50 random letters, paste them all together with a collapse, and we replicate it 10 times to 100 times as strings 10 and 100. And then we create like a collapse function that 
basically goes through and adds to the vector each time, just like paste it. It's kind of a, it just says paste zero and like adds it in a, in a manual way. And if we look at the output from that, 10 is 186.5 microseconds versus loop 100 is 4.5 milliseconds. So far, far slower uh, when it goes up to 100 when you're uh, basically copying on modify every single time it adds a value, uh, it, it, gets, it gets bogged down pretty quick. And then if we just do the vectorized collapse, because paste is vectorized with the collapse argument, paste zero has the collapse argument as well. Um, we can see that the difference is 37 versus 192.4 microseconds. So only like, uh, you know, like four times, a little more than four times, five times uh, as expensive. So not too bad compared to this one that's reallocating every single time. I don't know what the underlying implementation is for pace collapse, but it's vectorized in some way. All right, so they did a the case study with t-test. And if we create a grouping uh, vector, and then we have a matrix with 50 rows with a lot of numbers, then if we use the formula interface, it takes about four times as long as just providing the two groups as vectors already separated. So internally moving around, I think y'all actually talked about this in the August, y'all talked about this in the TMWR group yesterday about how formula, when you put use the formula interface, you're gonna have slow down in your model build time just slightly because of formula. Um, and this is demonstrating that. So you can add functionality to save values uh, for each one, because this one is not going to save them. And if we use per map, it's marginal 0.04. Uh, seconds that it adds just to create that vector. So quite a bit faster. All right, t-test. Um, this t-stat function, which basically does the t-test math and then provides an output, um, or it, it creates a t-statistic for the particular group and provides an output. And then we do the formula for the um, standard error. And if we use this function, then it is a lot faster than the built-in RT test about 80% faster than the built-in t-test. And that's because of, again, sanity checks that are built into t-test. Um, so if you need to do t-tests on a large set of data over and over again, it's worth just writing your own function to do it as, as long as you know your data is uniform. So what's interesting is I did this, so tstat, this tstat function was embedded inside of my t uh, when, when this was, this RMD was written. And when I ran it, it was about 0.26 seconds. And then when I took tstat out, it was 0.22 because if it's embedded in the function, it's like reallocating RAM for that internal function each time, if we remember from the functions chapter, like chapter four or something. 
Uh, so defining your functions outside of the function that's calling them is a good idea because it's it stays allocated in the global environment and calls that, which that lookup process is definitely less computationally intensive than like reassigning the function internally each time the function is run. Um, so it takes off a little bit of that and yeah. And this is a means of vectorizing it. So instead of, um, so using it for more complex situations where we input matrices um, using row means and row calls, we can see that it's even faster. Or actually, these are just, yeah, these are just, uh, vector inputs as well, but mean and sum, I guess, are not vectorized like row means and row sums are because this is this is a lot faster here using row means and row sums, which is interesting. Hmm. Yeah, that's significantly faster, like seven times faster. Okay, so lots of extra resources here. Um, this is a package for profiling C code. Uh, if you're into that kind of thing, I guess maybe after next week, you might be interested. Um, evaluating the design of the R language that looks dense. <laughs> Uh, read our blogs to see what performance problems other people have struggled with and how they made their code faster. Uh, that's pretty useful. I actually have some stuff on that has been taped to my laptop since I first started coding R on how to make our code more efficient. That is like drilled into my head so far that it'll never come out because I taped it there. Uh, and it is. Well, it's like how to really address things quickly. So know the task at hand. Don't add features unless specifically requested or necessary. Uh, DNRY, do not repeat yourself. Uh, if you are going to be doing something multiple times, write a function for it. Just immediately write a function for it. You'll save time later. Pre-allocating space. We learned about that in chapter two. Uh, use as few function calls as possible um which is yeah no understand the syntax which is kind of what we talked about earlier like using usenames false with unlist like know the different features or arguments to the function and specify the arguments that will allow you to optimize it for your use case Functionalize everything. Um, if you use a function that uses the same variables, then write the variables into a single function. Um, use primitives. So the different operators, like the, you know, all the, if you go question mark OPs, those are all the operators. If you can use those, use those because they're vectorized and they're much faster than higher level functions um explicit use of scope uh make sure you call a function either using like the colon colon or something um so it's not searching for variables or functions in environments that it's not in you want to specify that so you can minimize that search time and then vectorization, which we just talked about, and you want to use the simplest data objects possible. Eh, there's kind of a trade off there, like matrices are really fast, but then you get the issues like we're finding in tidy models where like every single model implementation has different kinds of arguments and data structures under the hood. And it makes it difficult to grapple with for the coder. It's like non intuitive, you have to relearn each modeling package that you get and it's not as like tidy and cognitively easy to grapple with when you look at code 
when you're constantly dealing with different types of data structures. So that's like, there may be speed ups, but it might be at the sacrifice of readability. So it's something to consider. All right, read R programming books, like the art of R programming or Patrick Burns R Inferno. Take an algorithms or data structures course to learn well-known ways of tackling certain classes of problems. There's a Princeton course on algorithms there. Learn how to parallelize, parallelize your code. It's definitely worth doing. Two places to start are parallel R and parallel computing for data science. Parallel, parallelization has really gotten a lot easier with like the future package and whatnot. Uh, so definitely worth doing that. And then two other books, Mature Optimization and The Pragmatic Programmer. Apparently Pragmatic Programmer is like mostly C. There's some R in it, but it's like mostly C and like Stan and Julia and stuff. I talked, somebody was talking about reading it and they were like, well, there's not a lot of R in here, but it does provide some general tips. And that's it. Yay. Anybody got any questions or thoughts about yeah. that? Where is the source code for T dot test? I tried to like, well, I tried the way that I usually look at function code and it didn't work. It just said like, yeah, use uh, method. Yeah, I see that. Um, well, that means that it's like ptest dot data frame. Uh, if we check it, that, let's see if we can do that. ttest dot, there it is. So if we go formula, it looks like there's a formula method. Oops. Uh, I can just print it to the console. Well, maybe not. Usually I do Let's like see. view. Yeah, view is another way to do it. Oh wait, it's in the stats package. Oh my gosh, why is my computer so laggy? See if that works. There it is. Okay. So. So this is what he changed, or like strict. Doesn't really look like it. Well, he just he used like this. This output list is virtually the same, and then he just did the essential math for the t-test, which is probably, where is it in here? But I mean, all of this is all about like evaluating the formula, checking the formula, doing model frame, and then running that to get the model frame from the formula, stripping out things, and then like, making a factor of the stuff, checking the levels, do call t-test. So another function, that's where it does the math. So another function actually has the math in it. Let's see. So that's what happened, like formula, t-test formula, if it's a formula input, is going to run all of this stuff before it does the math. So let's see, ttest.default is probably the one that's going to have the math in it. Yeah, so there's some of it. We got the length, the mean, and the, the I guess that's the variance. There's the square root for the standard error, the degrees freedom. Some checks on that. There's the um, mx minus 
MU over the standard error. Sorry, my dad just got on the phone out there. Um, yeah, so he just like stripped it out to just, you know, the two mathematical computations that you need and took out all of, because this is all sanity checks, like not enough X, not enough Y, not enough observations. He also doesn't calculate degrees freedom. So leaves that out. Also doesn't cal calculate the p-value or the confidence interval. So, cause there's stuff that t-test is doing to give you extra info um, when the t-test prints that he's also not doing. He's just giving like the t-statistic and the, I think maybe the p-value. Let's see, where's, let's look at his implementation. No, so he's only doing up to the standard error. But he's only returning the test statistic. Yeah, exactly. He's only returning this test statistic. So he's not doing like p value confidence intervals, all the other stuff that is typically you would expect from the output of t test. So I guess the, yeah. um, the overall principle seems to be make technically make your code worse um, in order to make it faster. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I'm being hyperbolic, but like you know, technically speaking, you're taking out all the safety checks, all the additional information, and I guess what he's saying is when you're trying to create code uh, for like maybe productization, you can just rewrite it in a really stripped down way, which allows you to um, speed everything up. Yeah, assuming that you are very clear on what inputs are coming into it. Either you're checking that somewhere else previously. Um, yeah, because the last thing you want is to like crash your shiny app server because you implemented some C code that takes an input that is bad and you legit just crash the shiny server for everybody. <laughs> so be careful if you're going to use some C code and strip down stuff because that could definitely happen and then the R Studio people will come at you and be like why did you do this <laughs> <laughs> it, make, it makes sense um, I think the things I often find are the slowest in my code are um, it's always imputation always imputation um particularly mice imputation is mm. really really heavy slow yeah but incredibly effective <laughs> yeah i can't think of a better method um for what i do um they have put parallel in so that brings us back to the parallel argument about how do you do that um and i tried to implement their parallel version and for some reason my code just stopped working I couldn't work out what to do with it. And it's still sat there, just slowing everything down. Huh. Was that the mice fast? Mice fast a, package? Um, there is, um, in the mice package itself, there is, oh. a, uh, there is an implementation version which allows you to use parallel cores, which speeds it up. But um, I couldn't get it to work when I did it. I don't know why but it's probably my fault. Well, it's definitely my fault. Um, but when you look at the differences in speed processing, it's insane. And so sometimes, I suppose, I suppose what I'm trying to get at is when you have um, a lot of processing to do, 
you can sometimes, instead of having to rewrite the package, which could potentially be dangerous, um, you could just actually throw in some extra cores in there, which has other costs as well, doesn't it? Which is, you know, the price of processing if you're on a cloud or alternatively potentially burning out your computer if you're not careful how many cores you allocate. Yeah. Yeah, I can, uh, I can't really, well, maybe I can point to it. Maybe y'all can see where I melted my uh, computer over my CPU. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yes. Legit. Um, let me turn on the light. So you can see what I foolishly did. Uh, so right up here. Uh, let's see if y'all can see it. Oh, it's got the, oh, wow. okay. See the like brown and the paint is like melted. Yeah, that's that's over my CPU there. That was from like parallelizing with for each and like really not optimized code and like running it on eight cores, which is the max on this computer for like uh, 30 something hours. And it was like in a relatively small room. I had a window open, but I, found that and I was like oh boy <laughs> oops <laughs> it's still I mean the computer still works it's like slow I think I definitely like damaged it in some way and I need a new one but I'm hoping to get the five nanometer processor computer in next year I mean that's kind of impressive <laughs> <laughs> what, melting the computer <laughs> I mean, like, you know, not a lot of people can actually get to a point where they can create a good enough code to melt their computer. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I think I would I, say it's I, foolishness. True, but it's kind of like a rite of passage, isn't it? <laughs> like, if you haven't partially melted your computer, you probably haven't done hard enough work. <laughs> <laughs> I uh yeah. my computer cleverly switched itself off when I um when I almost burnt mine out instead because I was doing um some uh some clustering and I had uh. selected probably too many cores and it was a very hot day and it just switched itself off. It's just like um yeah. because it, the temperature inside just went too high. So I'm quite lucky that it was able to do that by itself, be like, oh no, I'm not doing this. But I definitely would have burned it out, which is not great because it's only about eight months old. Oh, wow. But, yeah, um, I mean, it's questionable. Like, obviously, they didn't set whatever threshold should have kicked off this computer um, low enough because, you know, it was melting the plastic and the paint on the computer. So I think the newer computers are just like, there's more safeguards in place so you don't mm. fry your MOBO. I was just going to say, I was thinking like, you know, the whole parallel processing, that would be just a great chapter to have in, um, have in this book or alternatively to visit later on, because it is incredibly important as you scale up and understanding how to do it. It's like, I mean, it can, it, it can be done. Sometimes it's easy to just say, specify, you can just specify a cause, but other times you have to write mm -hmm. your code specifically to deal with it. And that's a bit, um, that can be a bit trickier. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, because I'm more of a, do more of the stats side of things rather than the programming side. Um, so mm -hmm. when it comes to the doing the kind of like more tricky code, I'm kind of relying on packages most of the time in order to do that for me, which probably slows everything down. Hmm. Yeah, I guess depending on the packages, I had never heard this tip about looking at reverse dependencies of our CPP. That's interesting. That's something I never thought about, but that's something I'm going to look into. Yeah, well, I mean, there is that parallel R book. I think, honestly, it might just be such a, well, I'm sure they could do like a trimmed down version of how to parallelize your code in advanced R or TMWR, but it's probably a complex enough topic that it that a whole book 
is that's why the whole book is devoted to it. I read um, this was what I read when I I started uh, doing it, which is um, written by uh, Roger Peng, uh, uh, um, John Hopkins. He just goes through the basics of it, which is just really useful, I think. But um, it it doesn't go. You're right. It probably doesn't go in quite enough detail. Oh, cool! Interesting. I think I read this too a long time ago. I'm not sure how I went and got the. Yeah. I was just going to say, I'm not sure how up to date it is. Um, so I can't speak to the. Oh, he has updated it recently, actually, uh, September last year. So oh, cool. Could still be relevant. Yeah, I'm using the Intel Math Kernel and the Microsoft R Open, which uh, gives some significant matrix multiplication speed ups. I like. Did not really understand what it does. Apparently, one of the people, there's a guy, Rob, I think his, Rob, his name is Rob Howe, um, H O W E, that works at our studio. He said he worked on the Intel um, R Open, or not the, the Microsoft R Open project. And he said basically the difference is, is they took the, um, mathematical operators and some of the matrix multiplication operators that you will find in the core of like certain modeling packages and they re-implemented those using this BLAS like type of parallel processing and so that's what it does is just like on a very low level makes those particular operators run in parallel uh, which you know speeds up a lot of things that use those. Hmm. I think generally every like reweighting, uh, like back propagation, like most algorithms use some kind of reweighting mechanism. If they have any kind of propagation, like uh, decision trees, boosted decision trees, or bagged decision trees, or neural networks and whatnot, and that all uses multiple or matrix multiplication to do that. And so I think it's you know it significantly speeds up those types of machine learning algorithms. What were you going to say? Um, I've forgotten. <laughs> Does up. anybody else use the R open? No. Do you guys use GPUs at all? Ah, uh, yeah. Th uh, sorry, that's what I was about to, I was just thinking about actually. <laughs> um, sorry, carry on. I don't use I don't know how to like use a GPU I don't think so at least not explicitly there's oh I, I was looking into this recently because of my uh, processing problems um because I didn't want to ask my company in order to set me up a small server um but I was looking into um and I, I'm sure Stephen will laugh at this um <laughs> If I could use an external graphics card in order to um, speed up my GPUs, sorry, g speed yeah. up the processing, which has another problem because the, you've got limited bandwidth going through USB port uh -huh. um, or, when it, or, or USB C, whatever it is. Um, so it's not necessarily going to give you a particularly good boost, um, but you need to have a decent graphics card in order to use GPUs. So when you install like TensorFlow uh, onto your computer, you've got the option of like using different, um, of using GPUs, um, which if you don't have the right kind of graphics card, it won't like, it will just tell you that you haven't installed TensorFlow or error. Yeah. Um, you have to have special drivers to, uh, for your graphics card to use TensorFlow. Hmm. But that's the great thing about TensorFlow. Automatically, you can set it up to just use uh, GPU straight away. So in that case, you don't really have to think about it. Uh, I tried it a while ago. I had read something that 
erroneously said that my graphics card could be used for it and it wasn't accurate. I spent a lot of time trying to get it set up only to have it do like a four day diagnosis process. And then it's like, nope, your computer is not compatible. <laughs> it's like, Wait. you're literally telling me the exact same experience I had. <laughs> I spent days on it. Yeah, yeah the same the thing. Boss is like, what you've been doing is like, oh, trying to get GPUs to work. You must have thought I was an idiot. Wait, when is when was your computer made? Um, my computer was made this year, so it should it should do it. But like, yeah. um, so so my my problem wasn't necessary. Sorry, um, my problem wasn't necessarily that it didn't do it, or sorry, it wasn't uh, able to do it. It's like for some reason when I was installing TensorFlow, it just wasn't connecting to my graphics card. Uh, and it turned out that um, like the drivers weren't updating properly for some reason. Um, yeah, it, it just wasn't. You know, sometimes when you know you got a bug in the way how it implements the drivers, it just wasn't working. Like my, uh, for instance, I have to use um, my headset because for some reason my sound card doesn't work properly. It's got some damage oh, to it. Huh? Did you? There's like, if or do you have an NVIDIA card? Uh, I've got a GeForce. GeForce and NVIDIA. Is oh, yeah, GeForce, NVIDIA right? GeForce. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, GeForce uh, GTX laptop card. Sorry, uh, graphic card. So it should definitely do it. It does do it. Yeah. Um, There's did like, did it. you did you install the like CUDA? I think that's what it's called. Um, there's like this particular driver set that has to be installed. It doesn't really say anything about it in the TensorFlow install. Um, yeah. I, I, so what I did was spent uh, a several day, a few days on trying to get it to work. And, yeah. Um, I can't remember what exactly I did, but TensorFlow did give some really good, great guidance. And eventually something worked, um, but I'm not sure what worked because I didn't do it uh, systematically. I just did a load of installing yeah. and switching off and then restarting and then putting out all the drivers until it finally worked. <laughs> it bugs me so bad when that happens, when like you're doing some new process like that that you've never done before and you do so many different things trying to debug and you're looking at so many different resources and all of a sudden it works and you have no clue what made it work and yeah, you're just he, like forever in the dark about it here's the really weird thing so i then i had all of the, everything that um tensorflow suggested to set up um done i went through all of it i then individually manually went through the um particular uh, dependencies in terms of packages which it was suggesting in r and it was saying it couldn't find and then i think one of the last the, the last but the thing is i installed the packages and it's telling me i couldn't see it couldn't see it so one of the things i then went and did was just installed anaconda independently yeah uh, or reinstalled it sorry because i already had it on my computer but it's massively out of date so I updated that and for some reason without restarting my computer it just suddenly started working and yeah it's just like is it because anaconda is open it is it because I opened it or is it because I updated anaconda because it didn't work the first time I opened it um well because so, anaconda has a dependency management system right so it mm. probably checks all of that it, it's just um it's it's a bit it was a bit of a nightmare but I think like with reticulate um you know this stuff is gradually going to come become a bit easier as um I, I mean I, I don't know if any of you are in the like the data science community on reddit but i see all the time people saying oh i use um use r for analysis and uh, uh python for doing doing the um doing the uh, deep learning part so they, they basically swap around between the two and i think reticulate really does lend itself really well to that um, yeah. So you actually got it working. Ultimately, you did get it working. It does work now. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> have you have you uh, like benchmarked or like looked at run code that you ran previously 
on just your normal cores versus your GPU and seeing if there's like um, benchmark I, speed ups? I haven't benchmarked it, but it's a lot okay. faster. It's a lot faster. Um, uh, what, uh, example is when I was doing some clustering and um, it was mm. taking like, you know, eight hours of my life, uh, which was really annoying because I couldn't do anything on my computer, uh, even when I was doing parallel processing. And then I swapped over to um, swapped over to TensorFlow and using GPUs, or well, I presume it was using them. And it, um, it just did it in an hour. In fact, it wow. might have been less. I think, I think it might have been half an hour or something. So it took a six hour process and turned it down to like about half, of that. well, an eighth of that, 12th that time. It's incredible, it's incredible how quickly it speeded up. Saved you a lot of thumb twiddling. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, nothing's worse than sitting around. Because the other thing is, because it's your computer, you can't really do anything else unless you've got another laptop. Um, in yeah. which case, you know, so you're losing time to do work um, that you could do otherwise, which is be analysis, doing any kind of like, you know, look, issue tracking, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, speeding up really does stop you from getting bored. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Good chat, guys. I'm going to go enjoy the sun some more. That sounds awesome. Have fun. It's great. See you later, Tori. Next week, the last one. I think or... so. Let me see. Uh, Roberto did suggest doing a kind of like an overall. Um, it is, yes. Uh, like, uh, kind of like a, I suppose, a summary uh, session. Okay. Cool. Um, but, like, I don't know, how, like, how we'd go about doing that. Well. I guess we can talk about it next week. Next week, yeah. yep. Okay. Bye. Okay, see you later. I, I guess to be said about, like, speeding up code, the parallel implementation that I had for the machine learning that I was doing was taking nine, nine and a half to like 12 hours per like data set. Mm -hmm. um, and then I modified the code. I moved it from for each to future and like really heavily went through and optimize the code to make it more efficient. And um, it was like stuff that I had hand coded and it brought it down to like two hours per one, like per, it's a stock kicker. So the, the previous time it was like, I was, if I'd wanted to do 20, it was like 20 times nine. So roughly almost a week of like running in <laughs> parallel to do all of it. And then when I reduced it, it came down to like two hours. So like I can, if I want to do 20, it'll take like roughly two days to get all of it done. But that's like, it's crazy once you're doing a lot of data, how much it can really add up uh, if code is inefficient or like if you're not running in parallel, especially. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I suppose that um, when you spend more time um, when you actually get get to these bottlenecks in terms of processing time, you it kind of forces you to ex look at your code and uh, experiment a bit better. I mean, like I say, I spend less time looking at the functions and do changing them up myself. I certainly um, I'm going through a testing process at the moment with some metrics that are made, and that's part of uh, the process that it does, takes to create those uh, features is quite resource intensive, but I'm kind of looking forward to stripping it out, stripping out huge chunks of it. Because at the moment I'm trying to build several different features and they're not all useful. It's, it's sort of yeah. testing them and finding out which ones are useful. And then once once you got to that point, you can uh, move them off. But, you know, some things are just like, you know, I couldn't, I'm not sure I'm capable of rebuilding the mice imputation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty complicated yeah no yeah mice is useful i mean there's this mice bath package but like it's got a c implementation but i haven't really figured out like how to actually 
use it, but it's supposed, I guess it's supposed to be faster. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, that, that could be something worth looking into. Yeah, I just use mice with the RF um, method, I think is what it is. And that works really, really well for filling in blank data. Um, all right. Well, good luck. <laughs> um, um, I was just thinking the, um, you know, we talked about, in, I think we mentioned imputation the other day in, um, in the Tidy Models uh, book club. And the, well, actually, one of the things we talked about were, um, you know, the methods which were regression and classification, uh -huh. but didn't have clustering in there. Oh. And I presume, I presume that's because they put clustering in recipes, but it seems to be that virtually, or it's in, in the embed package, but the, it doesn't seem to be that there's an awful lot of um, clustering techniques available within tidy models at the moment. Um, there's only one, right? Well, I think the embed package might have another one. Okay. Um, it shouldn't be in there though. Um, but this K, K means is one that's used all the time. Yeah. Love it, but I've got to say, I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of it. Um, I think it creates some pretty shitty data, to be honest. But um, maybe, maybe that's just my experience with the kind of data I'm working with. Anyway. Yeah, it doesn't work very well for some scenarios. Uh, there is a package, you've probably used it like cluster crit um that uses like criterion metrics to see like how much variance is captured by your clusters uh basically like the mm. obviously like the less variance in your clusters the better the clusters are more or less um and so it has these things for like computing the criterion for your for your clusters and that i I was doing a clustering, a project that required clustering a while back. And I found that useful for like comparing different clustering methods mm. to see which like did the best with that particular type of data. It was geographical spatial data that I was okay. doing it with. Um, and, but I found that useful for like comparing different clustering techniques. I know that tidy models, like they have a, tutorial on like how to implement your own like if you want to take a package and implement a tidy model framework for yeah, it I, but it's, I, I it's added involved. that to i added that to the group the other day because um we we're talking about how um uh uh what's it called uh tidy quant is it um yeah yeah, they want, tidy yeah, quant, yeah. yeah tidy quant um we we're talking about how uh tidy quant um, is basically an implementation using the tidy models framework um, of different methods. And I, I know, because I do the learning labs uh, or pay for it with Matt Denko, uh, uh -huh. um, that he uses like um, uh, modeling systems that don't appear to be in uh, tidy models at the moment. Uh, so uh, I imagine he's got a lot more. Go he's got a bit going on there. I've got to say, he's quite a very impressive, very impressive guy. He just seems to like churn churn out code really easily. Yeah, definitely. I've been fall. I followed like one of his tutorials just to get up and running with mm. time series and tidy models. Uh, and like he has like um. There's like a table time package that mm. uses it, it generates all these features for time series that make uh, machine learning yeah. model builds work better, like being able to detect trend and seasonality and whatnot by mm. making these extra features. Uh, and I was using an article on that to implement that in the in the thing I'm working on. He, he he makes it so that it's really easy to productize um your code um on in, ti in time series because no one else is really in the time there isn't really many people in time se series um um ecosphere i suppose you might call it and i know that there's rob 
uh, a hive moon. But the thing is, is mm -hmm. the tidy what's it called tidy verts is kind of like it's really good, but it's not really quite good enough for um, it's not good for good enough productization, and it also relies on like to sibyls. Whereas with tidy yeah. quant, you can use a tibble. So like, well, why do I need to convert something to a to civil or to um, to a TS? Why can't it just be a why can't it just be a tibble? Yeah. Or, um, you know, there's no there's no reason why it shouldn't be, apart from for speed. But if I've got loads of um, regressors, then I'm gonna it needs to be, you know, there's no point in turning it into different data structure because it kind of just may as well work as a tibble anyway. I mean, that's how I think. Um, maybe I'm missing out on a speed issue or something like that. But um, I suppose I've been why picking you... apart civil actually mm -hmm. um, because I'm building it into the Alpaca for R package um, to be the data structure for the like stock data, ticker data. Hmm. And the, the, what Sybil does is it adds uh, like index features and it checks to see that those index features are regular. So a lot of data will come in gaps, like you'll have random gaps. And if you just kind of like run your modeling, it doesn't know that like there's a date or like a particular interval that's missing it just like continues to work as if that data is not missing but Sybil has like validation checks and whatnot to make sure that like it's either regular or irregular explicitly so that you know if you have irregular data that you either fill it um to have it be you know exactly one unit interval for every single data point in it um, or you just mark it irregular and, you know, account for that in your modeling and whatnot. And so that's, I, that's, I think, the, the primary thing that Sybil accounts for. It also has some useful, useful features for just like working with time series, mm -hmm. uh, like being able to identify the gaps in a time series. Um, that was a really useful function that I looked at because like, getting data from an API or getting data from a database, you know, if there was an outage in your database and the database team like didn't tell you and for data is just missing and, but it doesn't show up uh, when you call it um, from SQL, then you, you can like use functions like the, the gap uh, functions to identify like where you have gaps in your data that might be causing problems or causing you to see weird you know, phenomenon in your modeling process that you just, mm. you just didn't see it because you've got thousands and thousands of rows and you didn't know there was a gap there of like two days or whatnot. Yeah, it's really impressive that it does that. I mean, of course it, um, you know, going back to what we talked about before, it's like, it does slow things down, but at the same time, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's better to be, um, it's better to not miss that piece of data because you can really, you know, anything the way data suddenly missing could really throw out any modeling system yeah yeah exactly so yeah i've been kind of more or less trying to figure out how to been reviewing the chapter on like methods and how to build your own uh method mm. or not method um class build your own super class and so i'm trying to build a super class on civil and yeah because i want to add like i want to stick the the symbol the stock symbol to the actual data structure itself so it never like comes apart instead of having it like as a named list uh have it like actually part of the data set and then adding like query data like when it was retrieved from the server and whatnot like having that data attached to it as well and more or less just be able to learn how to make super classes because i think that's a useful thing to be able to do and so that's what i'm working on right now and then i'm gonna i'm excited to use tidy quant again with the uh modeling and 
forecasting process. Yeah, I, I've got to say, I mean, I, I love time series. Um, it's, it's endlessly fascinating. Um, uh, like, I know a lot of people like the kind of like image data and, you know, what you can do with that. And that is really, really impressive. But time uh -huh. series is just has this level of complexity for me that I just find incredibly fascinating because of, you know, pulling out the patterns out of that and um, trying to work out when things are going to change by adding in um, useful regressors or not. I mean, that's my whole job. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously, if you didn't find it very interesting, you know, be very, very bored. But um, tidy, tidy quant is just incredible. And, you know, I've only started scratching the surface with it. What I'd really like to do is get my company to allow me to productize a lot more R scripts rather than having it all implemented in Java because some, every time they change something in the back end, that well, every time the developers change something in the system they seem to want to strip something out and i'm like why would you do that um <laughs> they, they and then you have to change it upstream right you have to like refactor your own code yeah i just don't i don't know it's kind of like that they seem to be dicking around with the um with the um with the way how the modeling's the um neural nets function I don't know well kind of what's going into it or not. And it's kind of like, I just find myself thinking, you know, if I could get this all on to um, say TensorFlow um, or into like a cloud-based system, then we don't have to deal with this because we just have to throw the right information at it. Right. Um, and, and then you can just focus on like smoothing up your code and uh, things like, you know, processing speed and then, you know, additional products, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, uh, I'm still quite new. Anyhow, um, do they have like an ML engineer? Because I've I've heard that like with neural networks, there's a lot that you can do with like modified link functions to make it work much better with your data, like very specific link functions um, tailored to the data that you're working with. Well, I would argue, um, so I suppose that will eventually be me because um, uh, I am doing more and more to uh, skill up in that particular area. Um, mm -hmm. So at the moment I'm moving, you know, I spend the weekend actually learning Python rather than R so that I can mm. do the do a lot more courses on the machine learning, on deep learning side of things. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, at the moment it's kind of like they're using what I consider it's a system that works really well and it's very efficient for doing large amounts of coding. So it is recurrent neural nets, but mm -hmm. I feel like it's perhaps a bit dated. Or well, it's not dated, it's, it works perfectly fine, but I feel like it will be dated very soon and we need to start uh, pushing away from it, which is like something that I was basically having to make a business case for the other day about moving into, oh, well, what happens if we start using x or y machine learning library and then we can start controlling this a bit better hmm. anyway um <clears throat> sorry you don't want to hear my words <laughs> no i mean that's that's interesting i wonder i mean it sounds like they probably have some java people on the team that are working with that like do you have a r port to that neural network or is that like where are they what is that what are they doing with that neural network um, I don't. I don't exactly know. They just tell us how it works, and we just throw features at it at the moment. Um, but the um, they do have some guy, two guys who um, do a lot of the work on the on the actual kind of like how the information is interpreted, kind of thing in the net. So I huh. would guess that they're currently doing a lot of that work. And if we moved into another system, they might have to change somewhat. But then, I mean, to be honest, H two O works on java is works on java and so does some of the um some of the machine learning libraries in fact actually isn't um hardoof and uh spark wait is that right hard hardoof's java right um i'm not sure what it runs on Mm. No, MapReduce is Java, but Hadoop is Hadoop is written in C. Hadoop no, Hadoop is Java based. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's kind of going out of fashion though, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, have you talked to them about like, I wonder if you could integrate that and just like be able to call that from R. Like if you just build a wrapper around theirs with like the R Java package or something. Mm. I mean, maybe. I mean, like, um, like we were just talked about, you know, you could implement it in the tidy models, can you? Yeah. You and could. then that would just allow you the functionality of R in order to use that. Yeah. So, but like you're not actually interfacing with it. You're building up the data sets and just like sending it to their server that runs the neural networks or whatnot. Mm. Yeah, I'm doing the uh, I'm doing the crappy, uh, very kind of patchy data science thing at the moment, which is the rather than having an API linked in is, um, so well I suppose API, I've got one to the back end to where the data systems are, so I can link data which I've made up in my own uh, on my computer um, into the uh, back end, and then that just gets then I set up some other jobs. And we just run those jobs and then redo the models. Um, it's not the most efficient way to do things, but you know, it's, it's it's kind of like this ongoing process at the moment because I feel like myself and my boss were uh, were basically brought on in order to bring this, bring the systems more up to date hmm. and start start looking at them in a different way. Anyhow, um, I've taken up enough of your time, time Stephen. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. Thanks. Yeah, it'd be interesting to talk about like how to do some stuff with time series at some point because I'm working with time series as well. And I'd be curious to know like what you're what you're doing there. Well, would you like? Um, I don't know if you're interested, but like um, because obviously we were doing finishing this book off, and um, we've got the other book club going. But I mm -hmm. am interested in potentially. Do, I'm very interested in doing um, uh, Rob Heidman's forecasting. Uh, principles of uh, forecasting book okay um, and i think that'd be really good for the community to go over but it's, i mean it's also always good for us to go back over the basics and um you know do all of that but i'm not sure whether it would tie up with or stop us from doing other things because you might want to do something a bit more complex um like I really want to do this is uh, introduction to statistical learning second edition. But yeah, that it doesn't come out for a few more months yet, and the free version isn't available maybe until beginning of next year. So well, I mean, potentially you could like you could message it into like after the TMWR group is done. Mm. In between that and when that book comes out, you could suggest we do the forecasting book in between there and you would just suggest that there's like the what is it there's a slack channel on there that has all of the uh people in it what is it oh you mean uh, book club requests book club facilitators yeah you just oh, yeah. put it in there and be like hey we're thinking about running this for this time window um are you down and like john will probably get in touch with you to see about setting up a zoom for it and whatnot that's how i got the tmwr going was was that so i think it's joinable like if you just do browse channels or join channels you can add yourself to the book club facilitators channel hmm. um and you can I mean, suggest there, it in there yeah I, I think there's the only thing the only other thing i've been thinking about is that um you know tidy models we might want to go through to doing the feature engineering book by uh max coon i think mm. that's great book so it would probably be potentially not a great idea to start um start a different book when uh you know um feature engineering by max the max coon feature engineering book really kind of ties up very well with tidy models mm. yeah that might make more sense to follow it up with especially since it's like earlier in the process mm feature engineering and then you get to the forecasting later like you gotta have good features to do the forecasting well so yeah, yeah. maybe that's something to think about next oh yeah it's, it's difficult to plan out isn't it <laughs> it's just so it much you, there's so much you can learn like you know and you know, <laughs> yeah 
It's kind of nuts. I, I remember listening to a uh, podcast with uh, Hugo Brown Anderson and uh, basically saying data scientists are essentially unicorns because most people who do data science aren't actually the, um, what's it called, the ubiquitous data science scientist, which is related to the, you know, the three overlapping circles. You know, that's, mm-hmm. your, that's your unicorn, the person who's like right in the middle of the insect and all those. Um, like, I'd like to be like computer day. science, statistics, and where's it, math? No, it's, it's computer science, statistics, and what is the third? Uh, compu- uh, hacking. Wait, that's hacking. computer science. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 yeah, that kind of though. falls under computer science. Um, was it? Uh, oh, I can't it's remember. It's kind of like, Data engineering almost is like the other one. Uh, what is it like three? Um, um, uh, Venn diagram, data science. Yeah. Data. Well, that's not really data design, collection, and analysis. That's not. No, that's not the one I saw. Oh, that's it. There you go, on the bottom, in images. Ah, coding, statistics, and domain knowledge. That's what it is. That's right, domain knowledge. Coding is kind of computer science. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's very specific. I would argue that domain knowledge is technically science, to be honest. Yeah, typically. Yeah. Um, You know, one day I'd like to be a unicorn. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Anyway. Or your horn. (laughs) <laughs> on that bombshell i'll leave you all right sounds good good to talk see you next week enjoy the rest of your week see you later